Welcome. My name is Penelope Chatterton. Welcome to Awaken the Dream. My friends, Edmund Robinson is back again this week, and we are going to talk about creedless churches on Cape Cod. This is a follow-up from last week, and this is going to be fun, but we're going to talk, first of all, a little bit about the birth, maybe, of Unitarianism. Mm -hmm. Where did the Universalist part come in, by okay. the way? That seems like a big title. Sure. <laughs> it's, a, it's a mouthful, and it, we generally say you use. You use. It's correct to say you use. It's correct to say Unitarian Universalist. It's not correct to say Unitarian after 1961. Ah, okay, so people because, tend to do that. It's like if your name was Alice Joe, and I just called you Alice, it would not be your correct name. That is true. Okay, so uh, <laughs> Unitarian Universalism is the correct name for the combined denominations. Universalism existed from about the 1780s forward in America. Hmm. Unitarianism came out of the uh, churches established by the Puritans in New England, uh, New England Congregationalism. New England Congregationalism goes back to the first Puritans, to, to uh, the separatists in 1620. But the Unitarian ideas, set of ideas, uh, came forward in the uh, 18, uh, late 18th century and early 19th century. Now the word itself is interesting, Unitarian. Uh, Unitarian technically means someone who denies the doctrine of the Trinity. And we go back ah, to ah, a character in six, 16th century, around the time of the, Protestant, the first uh, salvos of the Protestant Reformation. Luther published his theses uh, in 1516, I think. Uh, and then around 1540s, there was a guy named Michael Servetus who wrote a book saying the Trinity was not found in the Bible and the Trinity was not biblical. And for this, he got the uh, death sentence from the Inqui Spanish Inquisition. Wow. And he fled to the Protestants, and the Protestants also gave him a death sentence. Oh. So he ultimately ended up being martyred in Geneva, in John Calvin's Geneva in six, uh, 1553. Um, okay. But his ideas spread. A lot of people thought that Calvin had overreacted. <laughs> and uh, so there was one branch of Unitarianism, Unitarian thought, that went into Poland and founded a church which lasted about 100 years and then died. But there was also another branch that went into a place part in Central Europe called Transylvania. And tran the Transylvanian Unitarian Church has persisted to this day. No. Yes. Uh, and uh, Transylvania itself was for a long time part of Hungary, and most of the Unitarians in Transylvania speak Hungarian, but it got transferred at the end of World War I to uh, Romania, where it is today. Wow. It's a mountainous region, and they, uh, there are about 60 or 80 Unitarian churches in it, and they now have mostly correspondence relationships with Unitarian Universalist churches in America. The, the church that I served before this one had a partner church in Transylvania. Okay. And we went over there and had uh, uh, helped them dedicate a building. We helped them build a building and helped them dedicate a building. They came over for our building dedication and so forth. So we have uh, interesting ties to this much older form of unit. European Unitarianism. Oh, okay. But in America, it's a product of the Enlightenment uh, and it's post Enlightenment thinking after the Great Awakening, you know, the mid 18th century, uh, Jonathan Edwards and those guys, the, some of the liberal clergy coming out of Harvard reacted against the enthusiasm, the emotionalism of the Great Awakening and said, well, now we're all about brain as well as heart, yeah. uh, and we can't let ourselves be swept away by these emotions. Um, and they uh, saw the Bible as a human document to be studied as another work of literature. Mm -hmm. uh, they questioned um, miracles, they questioned special revelation, they questioned um, supernaturalism, and they wanted to make their faith uh, consonant with their reason. Yeah. And so that was, they did not call themselves Unitarians, they called themselves liberal Christians. Wow. But, um, and that evolved into what we now call the Unitarians. That was the sort of upper classes in Eastern Massachusetts society, Boston and so forth, the oh. Brahmins. Oh. Uh, the, 
there was another liberal movement that started with the working classes and the, the artisans and the farmers, and that was more emotional and more evangelical, uh, and it was based on the proposition that God is love. And if God is love, how can there be such a thing as hell? How can there be such a thing as eternal torment? How could God sentence creatures that he loved to eternal torment? Yeah. That was the basis of universalism. Universalism is short for universal salvation. Okay. Everybody goes to heaven, there is no hell. Both of them were reactions yeah. to the Calvinism of the day. Okay. Calvinism, going back to John Calvin, the Puritans brought over. The Puritans set up a system of churches called the Standing Order, both in the um, Plymouth Colony and the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Uh, you couldn't have a town until you had a church. Oh. <clears throat> and then um, once you had a church and once you had a minister of that church, then you could apply to the Great and General Court for a uh, charter as a town. Oh. Uh, Chatham, for example, uh, tried several times to get incorporated as a town, but the, uh, the legislature kept saying, you don't have a church yet. You ah. can't do it until you have a church and a minister of the gospel. Ah. But those churches were state-supported churches. Um, they were paid for by public fisc, uh, and the ministers uh, were public teachers. And they, um, the parish, they had a dual form of organization. The parish was all the people that could vote uh, in those matters, um, all the eligible males in the vicinity. The church was a smaller body consisting of people who met a certain religious test to be allowed to take communion, or what they call communicants. The communicants of the church were a smaller body, the uh, parish was the larger body. And those churches uh, back in the 1820s, some of that liberal thinking came to the fore when you'd have to call a new minister. Oh. Would you call an orthodox or would you call a liberal? And some of the times there were pitch battles. Sometimes the church, the small membership, uh, would vote to call the orthodox minister and the larger membership would say, let's call a liberal. This happened in Dedham and it went up to the uh, Supreme Court of Massachusetts and they, it was stacked with Unitarians and they decided for the, the, the Unitarians. So a lot of times if you go through towns in Massachusetts, you will see on the town green, first parish church. Okay, uh. That means it was part of the standing order. Uh. If the liberals won back then, that'll now be first parish UU, Unitarian Universalist. If the conservatives won mm -hmm. back then, it'll now be first parish UCC, oh United Church of Christ. So the Congregationalists versus the Unitarians back in the old days. So that's the basic roadmap of how Universalists and Unitarians came to be in eastern Massachusetts. Now, we got, what, are you ready to go on to Cape Cod? Oh, yeah. Okay. Let's so, do it. So, we got some pictures to look at? Uh, yeah, we got, if we could pull up the Barnstable picture, that would be the first one we would start with. Um, that's that's uh, the Unitarian Church in Barnstable, and it's still there today. It has a wonderful minister um, and a wonderful thriving congregation. But it is the oldest uh, of our UU U churches in Cape Cod. I think the date was 1640 when the first people, it wasn't that building doesn't go back that far, but the um, Standing Order Church in Barnstable, uh, there was a man named Lothrop who had had a congregation in London and they'd been very persecuted. They were separatists. Now, you know, there was the difference between the separatists and the Puritans. The separatists were what we now call the pilgrims that landed at Plymouth Rock. Well, another branch of separatists came to Barnstable eventually with this guy named Lothrop. And he was a very much of a um, open-minded guy. We think of the Puritans as being very stern and closed-minded and not tolerant at all. Lothrop actually said anybody can be a member of this church regardless of belief. So that oh. was an early kind of creedlessness yeah. uh, in the Barnstable Church, and they should be very proud of that tradition. Yeah, but they are. They did. They became overtly Unitarian. It's sort of misty uh, exactly when, but sometime in the 19th century they became overtly Unitarian. And there was a West Parish as well as an East Parish. Now this uh, church that we're looking at here is the other standing order church on Cape Cod, and that is First Parish Brewster, uh, which is still existent today. That's the mother church of the church that I serve. Okay. Um, 
and First Parish Brewster uh, is right there in downtown Brewster. It had been founded, I think, 1700, roughly, and then um, it b became Unitarian in the middle of the 18th century, uh, probably without much of a fight. Ah. But um, so those are the two standing order churches in Cape Cod that became Unitarian and are Unitarian Universalist today. Oh, okay. Then you had the Universalists coming ashore. The Universalists first started Chatham okay. because the first Universalist church was in Chatham, 1822. And they say that when there's a group of people believing in universal salvation that wanted to form a church and they uh, procured from somewhere building materials which were brought ashore because everything traveled by boat in those days. Yeah. And when they got to the, the building materials were on the shore, supposedly some of the Orthodox people in the, in the town came and prayed over them that some misfortune would happen to them and they would not be able to build. Ooh. But of course they were able to build, they <laughs> ever thereafter saw it as divine providence, they were able to build their first meeting house. They had two other meeting houses and the last one was on Main Street um, and they built that when there was a hurricane uh, that leveled most of the other buildings around 1873 and they said it didn't, it spared that one and that was again an instance of divine providence. Okay. And they called it the Church the Hurricane Built. <laughs> but they fell on hard times. In 1944, there was another hurricane that uh, stove in the steeple on that church. Mm -hmm. And they had a problem because it had been, been a summer church for many decades by that time. And they had to decide whether to rebuild. They did decide to rebuild. They hired a new full-time minister and went on for another decade or so. But finally, it sort of fizzled out. And in the night about 1960, they sold their building to the Episcopalians, and that is now St. Christopher's Episcopal Church. Oh, gotcha. They've just done a wonderful renovation on it. Yeah, I've seen it. It's beautiful. Yeah. So that's downtown Chatham, but Chatham was the first Universalist church. The second Universalist church is Brewster, and now we're ready for the Brewster slide. Um, the, uh, that's, that's the original building. Uh, it's very near to First Parish Brewster. It's only a block away, um, and it's... Um, a beautiful building. It was first founded, the first minister was a man named Charles Spear, who was very famous in universalist circles for being a prison reform and anti-death penalty advocate. He devoted most of his, the 19th century to fighting for more humane prisons and uh, against him. the death penalty because this is consistent with the universalist view of a non-punitive God. Got if it. God is not going to be punitive, why should we be punitive? Gotcha. So a, a system of criminal punishment not based on retribution, but based on rehabilitation. Good. That's a universalist uh, okay. precept. Okay. Okay. So where's the uh, universalist church today? You may say it did bit, <laughs> bite the dust. My very question. In, in early, um, <laughs> well, it, I don't think it, it survived into the 20th century. If it did, it would have merged with the first parish Brewster. But we have a picture of the building today. Maybe we could bring that up uh, and and uh, show what it looks like today. It is now, uh, the building houses a uh, general store. Oh. The Brewster General Store. Okay. Uh, and, but you, if you walk into the general store, you can go, that's, that's it right there, the, the way it is today. And there's nice little benches outside. You can sit and have a conversation. But if you go upstairs in the Brewster General Store, you can still see the outlines of the uh, church that was there, the, the, the sanctuary from the front and from oh, the back. Oh, for goodness sakes. Um, could we have the next couple of slides? There. Yeah, there it is, good. So that's looking, looking from the, what would have been the pulpit area back toward the back of the church. And then the next slide shows looking forward, you can see the, uh, the, what would have been the chancel area. Oh, for goodness sakes. So that's, uh, that's a great little store. Yeah, it's a great little store. It's a great little store. Um, so moving up the Cape, the Universalists were, were, had many churches they established in the Cape. Um, there was one that was, I think, in Dennis that got moved to what is, is now the Dennis Theater, no, uh, the, the cinema, the no Dennis Cinema, kidding. was originally a Universalist church. Oh my gosh. Um, and in Orleans, the Universalists um, were a group within the Standing Order Church, and they decided to go off and form their own separate church in the 1830s, and so they moved across the street 
and built themselves a, a meeting house. And it, they were separate from the, the standing order church for a hundred years, and then they remerged oh. back in. So that church is now called the Federated Church of Orleans, and it is federated between huh. Uni United Church of Christ and the Universalists. Uh, oh. But the Universalist, uh, if we could have the next slide up, uh, the Universalist Church is, was sold to the uh, Orleans Historical Society and now houses that Orleans Historical Society. There, there it is. Okay. Um, that was originally the Universalist Church across the street from the Federated Church of Orleans. So moving out the peninsula, um, with the next town is East Ham, and the East Ham got some Universalists who were tired of coming all the way into Orleans to come to church, <laughs> so they decided they were going to um, form their own church, particularly Captain Pennyman, uh, who's, you know, the house there in, in Fort Hill, the, the Pennyman yes, house, yes. he was a uh, sea captain. Universalism appealed to a lot of sea captains because they went around the world and they were exposed to a lot of things. Well, that, that slide that we just saw is what's now the Chapel in the Pines. It's also known as the First Encounter Coffee House. It's right next to the library on Samoset Road in Orleans, I mean, in, in East Ham. And that was, uh, I think it's the 1880s, it was uh, established by, uh, hmm. as a Universalist church. Boy. And now it got absorbed into the Unitarian Universalist combined denomination after 1960 and became an adjunct of First Parish Brewster. But some people in First Parish Brewster decided they wanted to revive it as a lay-led fellowship huh. in the 1980s. And they went back to it and took title to the land. And it's been operated as a lay-led fellowship ever since then. No so you can go to church services there on Sunday morning. Uh -huh. uh, there won't be, uh, there'll be a uh, speaker, but that generally will not be ordained. I've, I've spoken there a couple of times. Yeah. Oh, that's nice. And moving on out the potential, there were uh, Universalist churches attempted in Truro and Wellfleet. They didn't last very long. I think the Wellfleet church, um, they couldn't put up the building because of a hurricane or something like that. It was knocked down as soon as it was put up. But in, in Provincetown, going back to the 1840s, uh, they did establish a, a wonderful church. Now look at this slide for a second. The interesting thing about that slide is that there is no apse behind that choir. Oh. That is entirely painted onto a flat surface. No. It's oh a my. complete, what they call, trompe l'oeil uh -huh. uh, interior. If you've never seen it, if you're ever in Provincetown, go see the first, uh, the UU uh, Meeting House in Provincetown. It's amazing, their, their uh, sanctuary. That's beautiful. And they have had, uh, wonderful thriving church up there. They've got a wonderful music program and a wonderful minister uh, that I like very much. Uh, and there's a, um, I think one slide there up there, um, the spire at sunset. Oh yes, yes, what a that gorgeous. That is such a gorgeous shot. Right in downtown, right near the city hall. Oh. And it's a, a beautiful meeting house for all kinds of things. They have uh, lots, they have uh, had a fair, what was it? Oh, I can't remember. The, I can't remember the, the, from the talk. But they, they were recognizing um, the mistreatment of gay and lesbian people in this society from the 1970s onward. Wow. Um, so it Good was quite them. ahead of their time. Yeah, uh, and yeah. So that's, that's basically the constellation. I've left off the islands. Both. Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket have beautiful old Unitarian Universalist churches. I think both of them were originally Unitarian, but I, I couldn't swear to that. Yeah. Um, do, after, go ahead. Do Unitarians, all of you, have a special, I mean, every Sunday do you all have a theme in, in, in general? Or do you recognize everyone's holiday. It's what's called congregational polity, so it depends on the particular congregation as to what holidays they'd observe and what their liturgy is like. You find that though there's nothing is prescribed from above, there oh. is no above, oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> okay. that they end up looking sort of like each other. 
So if you walk, if you're familiar with the liturgy in one, you probably will see a lot of the same elements in the liturgy in another. Okay. So you'll often have a sermon, which is usually the centerpiece. Um, you'll have hymns. You'll have uh, some readings and some responsive readings. Sometimes, usually you'll have what they call joys and concerns, which is where the congregation comes up and lights candles for deaths in the family yeah. or a, a yeah. special celebrations. Yeah. Uh, you'll often find that they will observe the Jewish high holy days. Yeah. They'll observe Christmas, they'll observe Easter. Uh, a few of them might observe Ash Wednesday uh, or Epiphany. Um, and you do uh, issues, I mean, political issues, do you do? Generally, generally, now, we don't march in lockstep. We don't have political positions as such on most issues. The closest we come is things involving gays and lesbians. Uh, most UU churches are very strong in favor of same-sex marriage and those kinds of issues yep. um, and have <clears throat> been <clears throat> active on the political scene. Excuse me a second. Sure. Well, you know, um, James and John came on my show years ago from the Provincetown uh, UU Church mm -hmm. with their marriage. Uh -huh. And so I know when you mentioned that whole town, they, John and James, yes. Yeah, J John, James Otterton. Yes, yeah. yes, they, they, they told their love story yeah, here. Okay. So anyway. Uh, yeah, they, they're wonderful people. Great one, musicians. Great musicians. Um, the lead plaintiffs in the case that came up to the Supreme Judicial Court and allowed same-sex marriage was a lesbian couple who were both Unitarian Universalists. The, the, no kidding. One of whom worked for the Unitarian Universalist Association. Okay. So we, and, and in state after state, as gay marriage gets accepted in state legislation, if you look at the activists behind it, you will find a lot of UU clergy, and so forth. Let me finish the rest of the story of Cape Cod, though, because since the merger, we've had two churches established more recently. Uh, one was Falmouth, oh. uh, which was a fellowship in 1959. They acquired land, I think, in the 1980s, early 1980s, from the Jewish uh, synagogue, and they have a nice um, you see it on the a nice oh. suburban style look, in the woods kind of church out that. from town. Yeah, uh, it's a wonderful, um, flexible meeting space kind of place. And they have a thriving church of a couple of hundred members, nice. uh, 250, I think. That's beautiful. And then there's our church, which is was founded from Brewster. There's a picture of uh, we celebrate May Day as one of the holidays yeah. we like to celebrate. That's fun. Um, and that's right. Uh, this old Greek Orthodox building was originally built as a uh, Christian Science Church, and we had a fellowship that used to meet in the Creative Arts Center for 10 years. I should mention the name Peter Fleck, who was uh, a lay person that was a, a, uh, ordained a minister in First Parish Brewster, and he's our St. Paul of Cape Cod. He spread <laughs> Unitarian Universalism up and down this peninsula. Oh and, my gosh. Uh, he preached there once a month, uh, until 95 when he died, and then his widow gave some money to the fellowship to say, have a minister, you can have a minister for a year to see how you can do with the minister. And at that same time, then this building came up for sale. Yeah. So they went and bought the building yeah. uh, as a miracle because they only had 35 people, but they bought this building, oh, yeah. got the new minister, and within um, the first day, they had doubled their um, membership and the membership went up to 200 by the end of the year. Wow, five minutes to go. They I call have to it, interrupt. They call that the miracle on Main Street. Yeah, that's fantastic. That so is fantastic. That's how we come to be today. We are, um, what, six churches on the Cape. That's um, Falmouth, Barnstable, Brewster, Chatham, uh, East Ham, and Provincetown, and then two on the Isles, Martha's Vineyard. That's and fantastic. So there are. There are alternatives for those who think they are spiritual but not religious mm -hmm. to go. It is a creedless church. We welcome atheists. Now, there's a whole, been a whole big thing about atheists and do atheists have churches and things. <laughs> we have welcomed atheists Good. for 50 years. Good. Um, they, the only thing is they have to be willing to sit in the pew <laughs> next to a Christian <laughs> and next to a Jew. Um, but if we will accept uh, any form of, and it isn't that anything goes. We have strong moral feelings, okay? It's just that 
as I say, uh, my elevator speech is, Unitarian Universalism is a religion built on the proposition that some questions are too important to have only one right answer. I like that. I like that. Now, are you only on the East Coast? No, no, no. We've got, all... uh, we got strong presence in California. we got them in Hawaii. A lot of people don't realize that when Barack Obama's grandmother died, yeah. Her funeral was in a UU no. church. No. He went to a UU Sunday school when he was a kid. Oh, how interesting. Oh, that is interesting. So in our last two minutes, you're all over the United States. We're all over the United you're States. You're down and south? And the world. We're, we're in the Philippines. You are. We had churches that, that didn't get destroyed by the typhoon, but we've, we've been sending aid to the Philippines. Yeah. Well, your web address is on the bottom of this program, yep. so people can come and find you. Mm -hmm. You have a 1030 service. 1030. Everybody's welcome. Uh, yeah, you're strong, you're strong, friendly, warm, you take care of each we other. Have fun. And you laugh. You have a very delightful choir person yes, there with Frank. Yes. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a good sense of humor and there's a good sense of relaxing and being mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah. That seems to work very nicely. And we say, come as you are. Come as you are. We believe in the uh, imperfections of all of us. <laughs> We bless our imperfections. Right. Uh, we, are, we are a religion which tries to F the ineffable. <laughs> and you play all those instruments, so you are Only a, one at a time. One at a time. What's your favorite? I couldn't say. You couldn't which, say. What's your favorite child? Oh, I couldn't say. Of course you could. No, no. Well, in our last minute, uh, what's your next? Well, you're doing Christmas. We're doing Christmas. Christmas comes out. The Unitarians and Universalists were both big on the celebration of Christmas at a time when it was illegal to celebrate Christmas in Massachusetts. Wow, um, really? Yeah, we've been big on the celebration of Christmas. Uh, it's not that we believe all of the magical stuff around Christmas. It's just that we want as an excuse to celebrate. We love a good party. <laughs> the Christmas tree was introduced into America by Unitarians. I've been given the single. That's great news. Thank you for joining us. And I'm going to take, thank you for having tell me. my friends, thank you for joining us on Awaken the Dream. We will talk to you again soon.